So I thought a lot about what to call this episode because finishing a piece just isn't the right way to put it. Too final. I hate to do this again, but I think the better way to express what I'm after is with an IT analogy. Since, as I said last time, you're never really finished with a piece, it's a lot more appropriate, in my opinion, to think about music as code and performances as releases or versions. In other words, your, quote, performances are better seen as point-in-time snapshots of what you could do at that particular point in time. Does that make sense? Now, I like the idea of cutting recordings, obviously, because um, they become part of the record, so to speak. For me, this is as much a journaling exercise as it is a hobby. When I watch or listen to old recordings of mine, it's, it's like an effing time machine. In addition to what I'm watching or hearing, all the other stuff I was doing, the things that were happening when I was working on that piece, it all just floods back in. Which is pretty cool, actually. But, you don't have to release recordings or perform for others, even. It's perfectly noble to just perform for yourself. Being an amateur is an inherently selfish act. What? I mean that in the best possible way, Hercule. Selfishness is underrated. As long as you're not hurting anyone or unduly inconveniencing people, the only person on this rock hurtling through space who you're obliged to satisfy with what or whatever it is that you're doing is you. And doing it will make you less angry, which is good for everyone around you. And what is it? Enlightened selfishness? <laughs> right. Enlightened self-interest. Adam, Adam Smith or whatever. So when I'm getting to that point, the point of cutting a release, I mean, my spider senses start to tingle in one of two ways. Either I get super manic because I'm in a groove and feeling it, or I've hit a plateau and Frankly, I just need to move on with my life. Now, A is definitely preferable to B, but either way, I still usually do a recording, even if I'm plateaued, because the snapshot is worth having, um, even if it's not good enough to release to you people. And for me, doing a video usually means uh, at least some sense of temporary closure. It allows me to move on without a sense of waste. This is just me, so by all means, like, you do you. What I'm feeling now with this first movement of Beethoven 2 is a mix of both, really. Because of this Amateurism 101 series, I've now sat with this piece longer than I usually do. Plus, factoring in that I worked on it four years ago, I'm actually quite ready to ink it and move on. <laughs> But at the same time, sitting with it longer than usual means that I've had a few pretty noteworthy breakthroughs. I reached my target of 124 beats per minute yesterday, and the trouble spot I covered last week is starting to feel pretty good. Like, I'm surprising myself more than half the time. And it happened again. Without having meant to, the piece is now completely memorized. Always a cool feeling, and Super helpful for a piece that has a lot of flourishy passage work and a decent clip. I mentioned practicing in rhythms last time, so this is a pretty popular approach for passages with lots of fast scales or arpeggios. And paradoxically, the idea of rhythmic practice is to smooth out, make more fluid, um, fast passage work, by segmenting lines into smaller chunks in various rhythms. So for all these triplet, well, ultimately they're sextuplets, uh, for all these sextuplet passages, you can divide them into bite-sized triplet chunks in three different rhythms. 
short, short, long, long, short, 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 long, short. last one, short, long, short, is super tricky, but is also the rhythm that's most likely to expose where your brain is misfiring. Conveniently, um, the couple of passages that I used this technique on were circular, meaning I could just play them in a loop. When I was satisfied, I moved the metronome up a click and rinse and repeat. So after weeks of metronome practice, it's always nice in this phase uh, to turn off the sum bitch, and also to start turning on your feelings. On the topic of feelings, one of my favorite techniques at this stage is what I call the trust your feelings technique. Stretch out with your feelings. <laughs> See? Which has nothing to do with emotional feelings and everything to do with uh, closing your eyes and trusting what your fingers feel. Memorization is uh, a prerequisite here, but what I will say is that it's an eye-opening exercise to close your eyes ha, 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 and realize that actually sometimes vision of the optical kind can be a hindrance. It can get in the way. Anyway, if you haven't tried this technique, uh, you should. Um, and then there's Lava Pit. <laughs> Sorry for all the Star Wars references. This is a fun and surprisingly useful arrhythmic technique. So you can play at any speed. But according to the rules of the game, you have to anticipate mistakes before they happen. If you don't anticipate them and play a wrong note, or play a note with the wrong finger if you're really hardcore, um, you fall into the lava pit and die. Now, on the topic of turning your feelings back on, this needs to be done gradually, um, such that you're not suddenly weaving around the bench uh, like a madman and throwing away all of the accuracy that you worked so hard for. What I like to do is give myself some latitude uh, and then reel myself in when I start to get sloppy, you know? For me, even though I sometimes like to exaggerate my performance faces, the evidence of feelings should be more audible than it is visible. An important arrival point is when you turn the metronome off and the tempo starts to become what I describe as fluid, but within bounds. Strictly metronomic performances are usually uninteresting performances. The subtle ebbs and flows of pulse make a huge musical difference in my view, and I have to work very hard at being for example, also aware of the space around me um, and allow notes to ring and decay properly, remembering that rests and pauses are as important as the notes themselves. These are all the things that I start to think about when I'm getting ready to record with varying degrees of success. So even as there's just tons more to say, I think I'm gonna wrap up this Amateurism 101 um, series with this episode. I'll no doubt uh, include more explainer type content in the future, but given that this is a purely selfish pursuit, what I really want to do right now is actually start recording the BEPs, and I think I'm ready. So stay tuned.
As always, thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, dislike, share with your piano nerd friends, and I'll see you next time. Bye.